Welcome to Measures of Variation. Whereas before we looked at the center of our data, uh, these measures look at how much difference there is between each piece of data. Are they all clumped together and really similar, or are they all spread apart and there's a lot of distance in between each data piece? So that's what we call the measures of variation. And uh, the two really key measures that are produced and displayed are variation and standard deviation and the two really are the same thing uh, so most people just uh, report standard deviation so that's going to be the big one is uh, we're really only going to care about uh, for the most part standard deviation first thing to know is in order to um, work with these things Take two. Another uh, measure of variation is the range. It's uh, extremely sensitive to outliers and so it's not used a lot. Um, it's also kind of simplistic to just tell people what's the maximum value minus the minimum value. So again, it's not used a lot, but that is one measure of variation. The round-off rule for the measure of variation, you'll see these rules over and over again in the book, and um, the best thing to do is just never round until the very end. So when you're using technology, it's pretty easy to not have to worry about this because it doesn't round until it gives you the final answer. So the standard deviation of a set is uh, denoted by just a lowercase kind of italicized s. And that's for our sample. If we're talking about um, what it is for the population, it's uh, lowercase sigma, which I'm horrible at drawing, but that's a lowercase sigma. And that would be for um, the population. Here's the formula for standard deviation, and luckily we have technology to do all this for us because this formula can get a little cumbersome, but it's um, pretty easy to kind of see what's going on. You take each data value, that's your x, so that's each piece of data. You subtract the mean from it. So you're basically measuring how far each data is from the mean, right? How far does it deviate from the norm, deviate from the average? and then you're taking that overall difference, right? You see you got parentheses around here, so you take that overall difference and you square it. Then you add them all up and then divide by n minus one, which is almost how many things you have, right? So if you divide by how many things you have, aren't you taking an average? So we're basically, getting, you know, because we're summing up and dividing by. So you're basically getting an average of the squared distances um, from the mean and then you take that square root and your you know the square root undoes the square and so you know in essence you're getting the average distance from x bar right the average distance from the mean that's pretty much what this formula does there's a second formula, they call a shortcut formula, but I'm not a big fan of learning two different formulas to do the same thing, so I would suggest skipping it. Some properties of the standard deviation to keep in mind, because we square each thing before we add it up, well, when you square something, it becomes positive. If you add them all up, they're still positive. If you take a square root, it's still positive. So the standard deviation is always positive. Right? So if you get a negative number, you've obviously done something horribly wrong. Um, the standard deviation is um, probably just as bad, if not worse, than the mean when it comes to uh, being influenced by outliers. So as it says here, it can increase dramatically right, with the in, uh, inclusion of outliers. So it just basically means outliers are a bad thing for this. Outliers pretty much are a bad thing for almost all of our statistics. And um, even though we're squaring everything, we are then square rooting it, so the units of the standard deviation come back to the same units of the original data. So if your original data, let's say, were a bunch of measurements of distances in feet, your standard deviation is still going to be listed in feet, whereas if you just listed the, um, the variation, the variation would be in feet squared, but the standard deviation is going to be in feet.
another reason why people tend to report the standard deviation over the variation. All right, let's use this uh, simple set of data to uh, calculate uh, standard deviation by hand. We're only going to do this once, then we're going to let technology do it for us. But if we do it by hand, we can get a good idea of how the formula works and, and really what the standard deviation is telling us. So I went ahead and put our numbers here in this column, and I summed them up and got the mean. So this is our x bar, right? So the first thing we need to do is calculate the this deviation, right? This x minus x bar. So you take each number and subtract the mean from it. So this is going to be a 2, but this is going to be a negative 2 because you have 68 minus 70. So your deviations can be plus and minus because this tells me this number is 2 above the mean, but this tells me that this number is 2 below the mean, right? So this is 5 below, 2 below, and a positive 7. If you add all those up, right, this is negative 7 cancels the 7, negative 2 cancels the 2, you get 0. And you'll always get 0. If you don't get 0, you've made a mistake. So it's an easy check uh, to make sure that you haven't uh, made an error. Okay, so those are our deviations. Now we square them all. So that's 4, 4, 25, 4, and 49. Uh, so these numbers here just basically represent this piece of the formula, right? We've taken the deviations and then we've squared them. Now what we want to do is add them all up. That's the next step. So we have to add them all up. So that's uh, 12 which gives us uh, 37, which gives us 70, 86, if I didn't mess up my math. So our sum is 86. The next step is to divide by n minus 1. So n, remember, is our uh, sample size, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so n equals 5, so of course n minus 1 equals 4, duh. So we do 86 divided by 4, which gives us 21.5. And then the last step is to take that square root. So now we have to take the square root of 21.5 and we get 4.6368 roughly right rounding to four decimal places so that tells us that about 4.6 is pretty much the average of each number from the uh, mean. And if we were to actually take these numbers and think of them as distances and no longer let them be uh, pluses and minuses, and so we just made them all positive, right? And then did the average of those numbers. Well, now we've got 2, 4, 9, 11, 18 and then 18 divided by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right, but we still got to do n minus 1, so 18 divided by 4 gives us 4.5. So you see how those two numbers are very similar. We're pretty much getting uh, the average distance if we were to divide by n minus 1 instead of n, and I know you guys are, are probably just going, why are we divided by n minus 1 instead of n? Well, it turns out that um, if you look at a population of data, all right, so we can take a bunch of data and we can treat it like a population and we can calculate its standard deviation. Now, if we go and take a sample from that population, sample of size, let's say 100, we just randomly pick 100 numbers, we calculate its standard deviation using n instead of n minus 1, right? divide by 100 each time. And we 
put that sample back, take another sample of 100, calculate its standard deviation. Do that over and over and over and over and over again. What we find is that the standard deviation that we get from our sample of 100 will systematically overestimate the actual standard deviation of that entire set of data. Um, when we do our other statistics, our means, we know that if we have a population of data and we take a sample of size 100 from that and we calculate the mean normally, sometimes we'll get numbers that are exactly the same as the population, sometimes we'll get numbers a little bit above, a little bit below, but we'll get a nice distribution evenly on, on both sides of the true mean of the population. But with standard deviations, we all, it always tends to overestimate. So they found by doing the crunching of the numbers that if when calculating the standard deviation, instead of dividing by n, you divide by n minus 1, right? So you divide by a, um, a slightly uh, small, uh, smaller number, which makes, I'm sorry, did I say it always overestimates? It always underestimated. Um, it makes the number a little bit bigger and it, it makes it land closer to the actual true standard deviation. So um, basically what it means is the standard deviation is, is what people call a, a biased estimator. It, it doesn't bounce back and forth. It's always biased to one side. And so by doing the n minus 1, we um, control for that. We kind of correct for it. So it's a correction method and this just gives us a standard deviation that is closer to the actual standard deviation of the population. And that's the whole point why we do all this junk is we want to know uh, what the measures are of the actual population so we're hoping that the results we get from our sample are close to that and by dividing by n minus 1 instead of n we achieve a result that is much closer. Okay, uh, the range rule of thumb for understanding the standard deviation uh, is, is something that will come up a lot more in uh, further uh, sections, but it's just telling us that the vast majority, right, pretty much around 95% of all of our data will lie within two standard deviations of the mean. So visually, if this is our mean, and we go out a distance of 2s in this direction, right, and 2s below, this cutoff will be the, the, the range, right, the number, the all of our data, not all of it, but roughly 95% of it, will be in between those two numbers. So let's just put some numbers in here to help you figure that out. Let's say our average was 50, right, and our standard deviation was uh, simply 5 to make the numbers really easy. Then 2 times our standard deviation is 10, so we're up here at 60 and then down here at 40. This just tells us that roughly 95% of our data values will be between 40 and 60. Okay? A range rule of thumb for interpreting a known value of a standard deviation. Um, this is just a, a, a bunch of uh, fancy words to tell us that we are going to define something as usual if it falls within that two standard deviation range from the previous slide. Anything that falls outside of that two standard deviation range is considered unusual. So if we go back and uh, look at the data from our example, we had an average of 70, right, and a standard deviation of 4.6, blah, 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 blah. Let's just make it 4.6. We'll just round to that uh, to make the, the math a little easier. So we have an average of 70, right? That's our x bar. And we got an s of 4.6. So 2 times our standard deviation is just 9.2. So if we go up 9.2, we get a cutoff of 79.2. If we go down 9.2, we get 60.8. And all this tells us is that someone with a, what we consider a usual, right, heart rate should be somewhere between um, 60.8 or 61 beats per minute, right, and 79.2 or roughly 79 beats per minute. Anything below 61 or above 79 would be considered unusual, be out there in, in the extremes. Um, ignore this, using the, the, the range and dividing by 4 to get you an estimate of the standard deviation is a horribly uh, inaccurate thing to do and since we have technology it's no longer necessary so you can just skip that example. Um, comparing variations from samples with um, different means becomes very tricky 
because if you have a standard deviation of 4 from one sample and a standard deviation of 25 from another sample, you might think, wow, that other sample is, has a lot more variability to it. It's got a much bigger standard deviation. But what if the standard deviation of 4 came from data where the average was like 0.2? and the one of 25 came from an average of like 150. So you need to weight it by the average and that's where the coefficient of variation comes from. It's a way of comparing standard deviations between two different samples when those two samples have uh, different averages. So it's a very simple uh, calculation. All you're doing is taking the standard deviation dividing it by the average and then multiplying by 100% to get your answer in percentages. Right? And, and this is just showing you the same thing but for the population so now we're using the Greek letters. So this is a great way of um, comparing standard deviations between two samples because now you get something that's weighted by its mean. Uh, population standard deviation uh, you can see it's the same formula only with n instead of n minus 1 and um, we kind of never use it because we kind of never have a population of data. Variance is just the square of standard deviation so in our formula and I'll use this one because it's just like the standard deviation formula if we just um, right if we just put in the the minus 1 uh, but if we didn't do this right if we didn't take the square root uh, then this thing would be squared and that would be uh, variance. So you can see why a variance is kind of a silly thing to report because if you know standard deviation all you gotta do is square it and you have variance. So most people ignore it and, and don't re uh, report it. So here are our symbols, right? You're just squaring the standard deviation and I've talked about this as it being an unbiased estimator and that's why we do the n minus 1. Okay, so let's go beyond the basics. Um, I've talked about the n minus 1, so this is just reiterating what I talked about that. Let's talk about the 6895 and 99.7 rule. Um, we've already seen that roughly 95% of our data values fall within two standard deviations, right? That was where we decide if something is unusual or not. Well, we also know that roughly 68% fall within one and then 99.7, or damn near all of them, fall within three. I like a picture. Let's look at the picture. So here's our average down below, right? Here's our X bar. And we can see that if we go out one standard deviation in each direction, right? That's what X bar plus S and X bar minus S means. We have a little over 34% here, a little over 34% here, and altogether this is 68 roughly percent of our data, right? And then we go out two standard deviations in both directions. And now all of a sudden, as it says up here, we have 95 percent of our data and then if we go out three, 99.7, and we get this nice little pretty bell curve where the area under the curve represents how much data there is. So you'll see that all of those percentages add up to 100 percent. So that area basically adds up to one, an area of one. And half of it would be 0.5 or 50 percent. So this bell curve is the normal distribution curve and we will uh, use this a lot as we move into uh, further chapters. So make sure you get a good handle on this. The 68, 99.7 is very helpful to understand but more than anything just understand the shape of the normal curve. That right there is the normal curve. Chebyshev's uh, theorem is discussed in, in the chapter. Ignore it. It's, uh, it's a waste of time. So we'll just end on the empirical rule.